Let everyone out tonight. You can turn to First Kings chapter 17 if you'd like. That's where the story kicks off. First Kings 17. <clears throat> My job this evening is to do a character study on Elijah. And uh, I've chosen four um, good character traits that he had. And I hope that we can gather something from this. Elijah was a mighty prophet during a turbulent time in Israel's history. And the nation had turned away from the Lord to worship Baal. And King Ahab had formed an alliance with Sidon by marrying the princess Jezebel. If you look at 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 33, we can verse here kind of um, what Elijah's up against. And Ahab made a woman, wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So whenever we get to 1 Kings 17, this will uh, make a little bit more sense. But uh, Elijah was sent to show Israel the evil of their ways. And he was sent to encourage them to return to the Lord because they departed from that path. Elijah focuses his ministry on the northern kingdom. He's condemning Ahab and Jezebel and their sons. And the interesting thing about Elijah, at Elijah's word, kings trembled, rain stopped, the oil never ran dry, a boy was raised from the dead, fire fell from the sky, revival broke out, and hundreds of idolatrous prophets of Baal were executed. Now, when we first meet Elijah, it's in 1 Kings 17. And um, there, there's not really much of an introduction. doesn't really tell you, like, you know, who his family was or what he was doing or, you know, if he's in a field somewhere. No, it's just kind of like, this is Elijah the Tishbite, and he's got work to do. And so Elijah's job is to go and confront King Ahab, and he does just that. He walks up to King Ahab, and um, he proclaims a drought for the evil deeds that the people have been doing. And he said, and this drought's going to last until... Pretty much I say so. And that turns out to be three to three and a half years. And right after that, the Lord told him to get away from this place, which I understand. I mean, if you gave that kind of information and thought you weren't bluffing, I think I'd just have you killed. I'm the king. So God told him, you need to get away from this place. And the Lord made a, a place to sustain um, Elijah, and that's the brook of Cherith. Ravens brought him his food. Uh, whenever we say that, we're like, well, that's neat, but how disgusting. You want a bird bringing you bread and meat? I don't want him bringing me meat, but that's what he did. Brought him bread and meat. Brought him everything he needed to sustain him. And there was water there at the brook, but eventually that brook dried up. The Lord then told him to go uh, visit a widow in a nearby uh, town. Uh, Zarephath was that town. Uh, and when he first met the widow, she was gathering sticks to make her last meal. And this is a very interesting story to me. And I'm only giving you pieces of it. I want you to go home and I want you to read it. Because as a kid, I was, these stories were like, wow, that's amazing. That happened? But this lady was sitting there and she's gathering sticks. And Elijah, for some, he knows this is, the, this is the woman. He says, hey, will you, you give me some water? Yeah, sure. Can you make me some bread? Well, there's a problem there. I'm gathering sticks so that I can take the last of my flour and my oil and I can make a cake and I can bake it, and then me and my son are going to die. We're done. We're out of flour. We're out of oil. And Elijah said, you know what? Make me a cake first. I thought, I thought that was funny whenever you read that story. So uh, the lady did this. But Elijah told her that as long as I'm here, until it rains, you will not run out of flour, and you're not going to run out of oil. And that continued to happen. That jar never ran empty, neither. But while he was staying there, her son fell ill and he died. And Elijah carried him up the stairs. He pleaded with the Lord. He stretched himself on top of the child three times. And the child came back to life, restoring him. And I started out with these, this part of the story because I think we have the first character trait of Elijah. You know, Elijah was a prayer warrior. That's what I've heard it called before. He was a prayer warrior. He was a man that, um, you know, whenever you look at the child here, the child, he needed life back in him. Elijah knew where to go. 
And he threw himself on that child and he talked to God over and over and over again. And that child revived. James chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Well, we're going to do uh, 17 through 18. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Elijah was a man of prayer. He was a man of prayer. Sometimes I, I chose this because this is something that I falter in. You know, sometimes when life goes good, we stop praying. It's interesting that whenever life's going bad, you know, calamity falls upon you, whatever it is, we, we seem to hit our knees, don't we? Because we know where our power comes from. But when life's good, we don't. I don't know why that is. Maybe as we mature, we, we get better at that. Maybe I'm talking to people who are already there. But I've noticed that in my life. We need to be men and women of prayer. <clears throat> but the story continues... Continues with Elijah emerging from hiding at the Lord's command, and he goes to visit King Ahab. And you can only imagine the reception. Three, three and a half years ago, he just told King Ahab, hey, it's not going to rain. Guess who had to deal with that? He's the king. You got to feed people, make sure folks don't die, water your animals, feed them. So whenever he meets Ahab in 1 King 18, verses 16 and 19, this is kind of his welcome. It said, Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O trouble of Israel? And he answered, um, And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, and four hundred and fifty prophets of Baal, and the four hundred prophets of Asher, who eat at Jezebel's table. And when you get to this point of the, of the story, it's kind of like uh, it's climax. In my mind, it's showdown times what it is. Elijah just called him out. He's saying, you bring all your people to the mountain, and I'm going, him by himself, and I'm going, and you bring all Israel because I have something to show you. And uh, if we continue in verse uh, 25, it says, Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first for you or many. And call on the name of your God. But do not put fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal, morning and evening uh, until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they'd made. And this, this continued on. And Elijah's mocking them at this time. He's like, maybe he took a trip. Maybe he took a nap. Maybe he's doing something else, but he's not hearing you. But Baal never answered. We, we know that he wouldn't answer. We know, especially on this side of the cross, don't we? But then it comes Elijah's turn. And Elijah says, I want you to fill some water pots and start putting water on my sacrifice. So they fill water pots, they bring them out, they empty them. He says, I need more. They do it again, again. Eventually they fill the trench to where it's, it's the, it can hold no more water. And then Elijah calls to the Lord. He says, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifices, and the woods, and the stone, and the dust, and it looked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and executed them there. Now it was, as stated earlier, it was showdown time. Elijah won that one, or the Lord did. But, but the point of all that is Israel needed to realize that the Lord is God. That was the point. Because they were serving Baal. They needed to realize that the Lord is is God. And I believe we can draw our next character um, <clears throat> trait of Elijah here. You know, Elijah was bold. He was a bold man. And I, I, I chose this because I know this is not a Bible verse. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I understand that. 
I had a, uh, a teacher in high school that I admired. I'm sure everybody's had a teacher in life that they admired. He was a history and geography teacher. His name was Mr. Stanage. He's, he's long past now. Mr. Stanage was, um, he was a special ops guy. So most of his life, he fought for our freedoms. And uh, he was very good at what he did. But the rest of his life, he was a teacher. And he was very good at that. But he was a man of principle. He ran the FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, at Richland High School. But this was not this exact poster. It actually had a picture in it. I couldn't find it. But, you know, that statement helped me through a lot in life. It really did. I didn't grow up in the church. Maybe you did. But this statement helped William Davis. And it says, stand up for what is right, even if you stand alone. And a lot of times in life, that's, that's where you're going to be. There's going to be a crowd, and if you're a Christian, a lot of times you should, you should be the man or woman out. You should be the one left out. But a lot of times we go along with it. We go along. Elijah, on the other hand, Elijah was bold. I want you to remember the nation of Israel had turned away from the Lord. They completely turned away from the Lord. And we got one guy, one guy that says, come up on the mountain with me, every one of you. And I'm going to show you what the Lord has to say. And, and he wasn't a popular man. Can you imagine that? You're the guy responsible because it hasn't rained in three and a half years. And he says, come up here with me. He stood alone when nobody else was standing. And his bold display as God's prophet proved the point, and everyone saw it, and they reacted, and they said, the Lord, he is God. Boy, I wish we'd do that. I wish William could always do that. Maybe you're the same way. So that's our second character trait of Elijah. Now the rest of the story. So after this joyous win for the Lord, the prophets of Baal are seized, they're executed, and King Ahab went and told his wife, Jezebel, now, Ahab does bad things, but his wife, she's terrible. And whenever he goes to her for advice, it gets bad. Because this woman just like, oh, you don't agree? Kill him. Simple. And that's the same thing here. He tells Jezebel, and Jezebel says, Elijah, I'm going to kill you. And I promise that. And Elijah, you know what he did? He ran. He was scared to death of this woman. He ran. And he ran, and he ran. He was terrified. He finally fled to a place in the desert. He prayed that the Lord would take his life. This is how bad off he was. He prayed the Lord that would take his life, and then he fell asleep under a broom tree. A messenger from the Lord came to him twice, urging him to eat and drink, and after doing so, he journeyed 40 days into the wilderness to Mount Horeb, where he hid in a cave. Elias is tired, he's lonely, he's scared, he's depressed. And he even prayed that he might die. And that's quite a change of tide whenever you look at the things that have just happened. We go from winning big for the Lord to just a little bit later where we're praying for his death. Or he's praying for his death. He wants it all to be over. So this is our third characteristic trait. And I titled this one Grit. Elijah had grit. You know, everyone in this room, if you've lived a minute on this earth, you've had ups and downs. We've been on mountains and we've been buried in a valley. That's what we felt like. We felt like we got buried in a valley. But life will kick us in the teeth. It always has. That's part of it. It's going to kick you in the teeth. But you're not alone. You're not alone in all this. I mean, whenever we look at, that's what's so great about the Bible. We, we see a, uh, a man like Elijah that did these wonderful things, but yet there were times in his life where he was scared to death, and he didn't know what to do. But God kind of gave the cure to that. You know, Elijah's depressed. He's, a, he's got that woe with me kind of mentality right now. And Elijah, if you turn to 1 Kings 19... We're going to read there in a second, but I want you to, to look for something here. So I believe God's cure in these situations is God gave Elijah work to do. He gave him something to do. 
You know, it's interesting. I mean, even as a kid, if I, would, if I was getting in trouble or whatever it was, if you gave me something to do, I'd be happy with that, at least for a little while. But he gave him something to do. Secondly, God let him know that he wasn't alone. God let him know that he wasn't alone. And that's very important, isn't it? Because there are times in your life where you're going to face something or I'm going to face something. And you know what helps? To know somebody's been through it. Whatever it is. There's a whole list of things that, that can bother us. There's a list of calamities that hit us in the face in life. But it's really nice to meet somebody who's went through the same thing and say, hey, I've been through that. Let me help you. Accept that help. Thirdly, God gave him a fellow worker. He gave him a companion, somebody to work with. And, and you're going to see these things. just wanted to point them out before we read it. <clears throat> 1 Kings 19, starting in verse 14. And said, And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. And then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king of Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu the son of Nimshi as king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahol, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elijah will kill. Yet I have reserved seven thousand in Israel, all whose knee have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. <clears throat> Sorry, that's what we just read. So that's our third characteristic of Elijah. So Elijah did get back to work. He got back to do all those things that God told him to do. And it takes grit and determination to get knocked down and then to get back up. It does. Get knocked down and get back up. And that's what we have to do in life as well. But then we see that Elijah met Elisha. S-H-A. There you go trying to help there. And he began mentoring this young man. And I'm going to call that our fourth characteristic is to pass it on. Because that, that's not easy to do to pass something on. You know, my dad was a mechanic for years. My stepdad was a mechanic for years. You know what William can do with a car? Kill it. <laughs> I can't fix it. But some things are hard to pass along. <clears throat> In 2 Kings chapter 2, 2 Kings chapter 2, we're going to read verses uh, 6 through 14. <clears throat> so we know that Elijah and Elisha spent a lot of time together. I'm sure there's many things that Elisha learned that are not recorded for us to see. But I like this story. This part of the story is interesting to me. <clears throat> It said, Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me onto the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on, and fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, he rolled it up, and he struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, so that the two men, the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I may do for you before I am taken away from you. Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, You had asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by the whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Pay attention to this verse. Remember what they did when they came in? It says, So... It says, Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he struck the water. What did they just do? Elijah came over, he struck the water, they both walked across. He's leaving, he strikes the water, and he walks across and dry ground too. 
That's learning. That's learning. He passed it on. It says, <clears throat> Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him. He struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elijah crossed over. You know, we've got to teach and train to pass it on. <clears throat> there, there's work involved. And the younger ones are going to mess up. And they turn into real good stories later on. We still tell them. But it happens. But we have to pass it on. You know, one, one of the a very sad things that you see is a man or a woman putting blood, sweat, and tears into a business or to a farm, usually farming, and uh, that person passes away. And then there's nobody there. That business dies because somebody doesn't have that drive that whoever did before they passed away. You know, there's one thing that's even uh, sadder than that, and that's whenever um, it's sadder when this happens in the Lord's church, and there's no one to pass the torch to. There's no one to carry on. There's no one to do the work. But, but the thing is, is that you don't just learn that stuff by accident. If you want to learn to teach, usually somebody's got to take time to, to put you aside and show you how to teach. If you want to lead songs, it's, it's that way too. Brady, you do a great job. Saw men here. You did a great job. <laughs> you're not a little boy, but you did a great job. But that's the thing. You learn. You learn, and you're not the best when you get up there, but you learn, and you keep learning. So if we don't pass that on, it's never gonna, it's never gonna amount to anything. In conclusion, this afternoon, what we can learn from Elijah is number one: stand up for what's right, even if you're standing alone. And, and I, this gets easier as you get older. I'll put a little thing in there. It gets easier as you get older. When you're young and, and you've got, you know, you're around a whole lot more young people that aren't as smart. They're not smart. Just go ahead. They're not that smart. And they make bad decisions. And sometimes we go, I want to do that too. Don't. Be the odd man out. Even in the face of adversary and discouragement, be the one that stands alone if you have to. Elijah remained faithful throughout, throughout the Bible. He's held up as an example of godliness and might. Not only is he mentioned later in the New Testament, but also in all four Gospels and the two epistles. He even appears in the transfiguration with Jesus. And when Jesus began his ministry, some thought that he was Elijah returned to the earth. So let's be, let's stand alone even. Let's be right and stand alone if we have to. We need to be prayer warriors, secondly. And I, I think uh, this one's more for me than, than anybody. We need to be a prayer warrior, not just when uh, times are tough, but when times are good. Because there's a lot of people to pray for and a lot of things to pray for, a lot of good work going on. Um, thirdly, pass it on to the next generation. Nothing sadder than a leader dying in an organization or church dying with it. Teach yourself out of a job. That's what we're supposed to do. Teach yourselves out of a job. And the story of Elijah, fourthly, can be a comfort and a, an encouragement to all of us. Being a strong person of God does not mean that you're never going to face discouragement. You're never going to be discouraged. But rather, it means you're going to look to God whenever you're faced with, with adversity. Elijah felt alone, and he didn't understand God's plan, but he still searched God out. And in return, he constantly saw God's power displayed even in his weaknesses whenever Elijah was at his week, weakest. Uh, he brought the widow's son back from the dead. He triumphed on Mount Carmel. And when he rained down fire from heaven upon the king's men, see, that's another story we didn't cover, and that's very interesting. You'll have to read that yourself. Um, you know, God is, God is faithful. And Elijah was one of the few individuals in the Bible that was just taken to heaven. Didn't see death like everybody else. He was just taken up. So what an interesting and wonderful character. I hope the study this evening has been useful to you. Uh, if nothing else, I hope you go home and read it to your kids, or maybe they'll read it to you. And I think that would be great. We never close a service without offering invitation. If you never obey the gospel, we can assist you with that. If you're a child of God, and maybe you've done something of public nature that needs correction, or maybe you just need the prayers of the church. Thanks for watching this video. I know what you're thinking. I don't want to miss another video from this channel. In order to avoid that, Click on the red button down there, subscribe, 
and then click the bell icon. Not only will that alert you each time a new video is uploaded to the channel, it will also help spread the channel to other people's awareness. So go ahead, do it, like right now, click on it.